Appreciate Pastor Price allowing me to, to fill his pulpit while he's gone. Um, I like to stay busy in ministry, and that's because I wasted 30 plus years of my life as a supposed believer, not doing anything for the Lord. And so I'm trying to make up a little bit for that over the last 10 or 12 years. And I surrendered to the Lord in 2003. That's when I went to Bible school. And uh, I believe every, I mean, it's not just my personal belief, the Bible instructs us that if you're saved, you have a ministry. I mean, it may not be a salary ministry, but you have a ministry. And it's, it's to your benefit to find out what that ministry is and then allow God to prepare you and to do it, okay? But as you're stepping out in faith to do your ministry, that's how he will prepare you to further do your ministry. So it's not like you just say, okay, I'm going to sit in church here for the next uh, six months and get all ready and built up so that I can go out and do my ministry. That's not how it works. God actually shapes you and forms you and molds you while you're doing acts of service, hopefully in his strength, not your own. Uh, and he will shape you and mold you as you're trying to serve him. Okay, so um, I appreciate uh, him allowing me to, to fill the pulpit here. I'm going to ask you, you know, some of these are going to be simple verses, but I do want you to turn to the book of Psalms, Psalm 12. <coughs> a fairly short message tonight. It's more of a teaching than a preaching. Uh, most of my stuff is, but... Um, we spoke this morning about the powerful tool, a weapon of warfare, really, that we have in intercessory prayer. And one of the other helmets, uh, the helmet of salvation was one of the armors of faith, but uh, the whole armor of God. But the sword of the Spirit, that's the Word of God, and that's what I want to talk about tonight. Not just ha because it happens to be another one of those uh, put on the armor of faith things. but. In Psalm 12, 6, and 7, uh, let's pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, again, Lord, thank you so much for the day you've given us. I thank you for the good report down in Miami Beach, Lord. Thank you for the good turnout that was here this morning, Father. And I pray um, that you would be with us again tonight. Meet with us in a special way, Lord. Be a blessing to those that have seen fit to uh, put down their flesh and actually come out to church on a Sunday evening uh, when they might be doing something else, Lord, because it's important for them to obey you, uh, to hear from you, to want to serve you with their lives, Lord. And I pray that you'd feed them in a special way tonight. Help us all to appreciate the importance and power of your precious words. And Lord, we ask it all for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I do want to talk about the words of God and how important they are. And then we'll look at some, uh, just a few powerful effects of those words. So here's in Psalm 12, this is a great verse that most Christians should have memorized. It says down in Psalm 12, 6 and 7, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. What's he talking about? He's talking about the words with the small w, the words of God. They're important. He promised us right there that he would preserve them from this generation forever. And you know what? If you go to any other Bible than a King James Bible, and you just go to this verse here, they've changed a few very important words in this verse. In verse 6, um, verse 7, it says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, talking about those words. <coughs> Most every other version of the Bible says, Thou shalt keep us, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve us from this gen. It's totally taking away the reference to what God's talking about, preserving his words. I know this is probably common knowledge to most of you in this room, but God's words, his individual words, are incredibly important. He tells us three times in our Bible not to add to those words, not to subtract from those words, not to change those words. And one of the more popular verses, at least it was 30, 40 years ago, it's still pretty popular, the New International Version, they literally have 64,000 less words than is in our King James Bible. Now, that's just the ones they've left out. How many tens, if not hundreds of thousands of other words have they actually changed or added? So, you know, anyway, I 
Praise the Lord, I have a, a Bible that I can trust, that I can count on. It's my final authority. I hope it's yours. It's a King James Bible. In our Bible, in Psalm 119, uh, there's one particular psalm, excuse me, in the book of Psalms, there's one particular psalm, Psalm 119. It happens to be the longest chapter, if you want to call it a chapter, in our Bible. And it's all about the words of God. God chose the very longest chapter in our Bible to expound on almost nothing else except the words of God. So in the 176 verses in that chapter, there was something like 180 or 181 references to the words of God. Sometimes they're called statutes or precepts or commandments and things like that. But it's all about God's words. He's trying to say something. This is important to God, and we should take note of that because it should be important to us. Do you know that there's 31 books in our Bible that are actually shorter than Psalm 119? That's almost half the books in this Bible are actually shorter than that one chapter. It has nothing to, it has nothing to do except talking about expounding on and just praising God's words. I'll give you another verse, Hebrews 4.12. It says, The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing uh, even to dividing us soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. That's powerful right there. <coughs> These words are alive. They are supernatural, and they have tremendous power. And I wish I wouldn't have messed up, uh, messed up on that uh, memory verse because that kind of gave some insights and how important it is to attend to those words. They are health to our life. They uh, do add, uh, uh, they are flesh to our bones, whatever that thing is. In Proverbs, it's all about how uh, our length of days can be increased just by spending time in these words. So it's not just a supernatural benefit we get from, from using them, knowing what they are, memorizing them, meditating on them. We get physical benefits, emotional benefits, maybe financial benefits, who knows? These words are supernatural. Now, I want to, to show you how important they are, I want you to turn to the Gospel of John, John chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter 1, verse 1. <coughs> The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word. And you see that Word? It's capital W. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If, if you don't know this, maybe all of you know this already, that capital W, the Word of God, it's just like you and I capitalize our name when we write our name. That is the name, one of the names for the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the capital W. Uh, seven times in Scripture... The Bible uses the capital W. That's the Word of God. So if we're writing about the words of God, the small w, we should differentiate because the Bible does. So I don't, I mean, I, you know, if you're a member of a congregation and you want to write to your friend about the Word of God, you capitalize on the W in the Word of God. I mean, I'm not going to hold you at fault for that, but if you're kind of in ministry, if you consider yourself a, a, a Bible, uh, knowledgeable about the Bible, if you understand the difference, then maybe you should, do it the way God does it. That capital W, it's not the name of God. It's not the name of the Holy Spirit. It is the name, one of the names of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Word. And the point I'm making is just because we don't capitalize these individual words, it doesn't mean they're any less important. Even the scriptures tell us contrary to that. All right? By the way, if God promised to preserve, which he did, all 800,000 plus or minus words in order, don't you think we'd have every teaching, every fundamental, every precept, every commandment he wants us to have? He was pretty smart. He didn't say, I'm going to preserve all my teachings, fundamentals, or precepts. He said, I'm going to preserve the very words in order, is what he's saying. That's why we don't add to them, or change them, or subtract from them. But look at uh, the capital W. That's an important thing, but it's it doesn't diminish from the fact that there's a small w. Look, just look in John chapter 17 to see the difference. John chapter 17, we'll look at a couple of verses here that just has the word of God talking about the written word. John 17, verse 6. This is 
is Christ speaking. He says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Okay? That's Jesus Christ speaking. He's talking about the word, the word of God. He does not capitalize it. Look down in verse 14. Christ speaking again. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. Look down in verse 17. Christ said this. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now I'm telling you, just because God doesn't capitalize the W word of God, that's not he's not trying to diminish its importance. He just wants you to realize there's a difference. Uh, you're going to come to find out, if you don't know it already, that you can hardly separate these small W words from the capital W living word. They're, they're both eternal. They both give life. They both use authority. Um, they both prophesy. They both are involved in our new birth. They both became perfected. Yeah, even Jesus Christ became perfect. He wasn't born that way. He was born sinless. But the Bible tells us he became perfect. These words have become perfect. You know what else? These words the small W and the capital W, they're both counterfeited as well. And that's the dangerous thing. You know, there's all kinds of other versions out there. Now, man didn't have the audacity. This Bible came out in 1611, and it took man 260-some years, it was like 1870, somewhere around that, where the first other, another English version of the Bible was translated. It took man that long to, to get up the courage to actually, you know, I don't know if it's courage more than ignorance or whatever you want to call it, you know, pride, to actually mess with these words and, and print them. And uh, I, I imagine those guys are incredibly accountable. And if they are saved, they'll be at the judgment seat of Christ one day and they will be wholly accountable to God for what they've done. Since that 1870, when that next version came out, call it a version if you want, uh, on an average, two versions per, per year for the last 130 some years. So now we're up to like almost 300 different versions of the Bible. Why? Because the love of money is the root of all evil. You know, and that's what it amounts to. Christianity is a big business and just like anything else, people want to make money from it. Well, let's look at a few more verses here. John 12. John 12, 48. Christ said this. In John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Christ saying, look at These words, they're going to judge you one day. They're going to judge me one day. It's, up, it's for your benefit that you know what they are. It's for your benefit that you know what they mean so that you can obey what they mean or realize if you are in a disobedience to what they mean. I mean, it's, he said, hey, this is what I'm going to judge you by. It's right here in front of you. Uh, if you live in the United States of America, uh, we have total access to this book. There's no excuse when you stand before him one day at the judgment seat saying, hey, he's telling you, I'm going to judge you by these words. Okay, here they are. You want to find out what you're going to judge by? Look in John 14, next chapter, John 14. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. God said, hey, if you really love me, you'll keep my words. You do. When you love somebody, you want to please them. You want to obey them. And if you know how to obey the Lord, you need to know what his words are, what they say. Um, look back in John chapter 6. John 6, find verse 63 in John 6. John 6, 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, meaning brings to life. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, 
They are spirit and they are life. Folks, these words are supernatural, and I hate to say it this way, but I will to make a point. You know, when I was a child, I used to watch cartoons, and you know, they had very simple cartoons back there in the 50s and stuff like that. And sometimes they'd have a little guy doing a magic thing with a wand. He'd always say something like Abracadabra Alakazam, right? There's the magic words he said to make his magic happen. Well, that's what these words are like. They are God's words, and they make things happen. And they speak to our spirit expressly. Because the God of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all things, the God who formed your brain inside of your head, he's the same one that wrote these words. And that hardware that he created is 100% compatible with this software. And brother, he wants us to find out what those words mean. And you know what? They communicate very well with the hardware that he's created. If you're born again, if you've got the Spirit of God living inside of you, which you do if you're born again, then that Spirit is what helps us interpret these words. It also nourishes and strengthens that Spirit within us to do battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. And that's what that whole armor of God and our spiritual weaponry is all about, especially the power of prayer. Well, let's look at a couple examples here. Look at Matthew 17. I want to set this up. In Matthew chapter 17... telling you, the Bible itself says that, uh, I think it was in Psalm 138, somewhere in there, the Bible says that uh, thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Okay, we know that the name of Jesus Christ is, is that in here somewhere? Yeah. Okay, okay. Thou hast <laughs> magnified thy word above all thy name. Um, we know that the name of Jesus is above every name. The Bible says there's coming a day when every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, right? Yet there, the Bible says right there, thou hast magnified thy word above thy name. Look at Matthew 17. This is uh, Peter, James, and John in verse 1. And uh, they're going up onto the mountain of what we call transfiguration with the Lord <coughs> Jesus Christ. It says, after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up un into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. This is Jesus Christ going through this transformation where he all of a sudden started glowing. Uh, and behold, verse 3, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias uh, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. This is God the Father audibly speaking to the people down below. And when his disciples heard it, verse 6, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down <coughs> from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the <coughs> Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Christ said, Hey, I don't want you talking about this until after I am raised from the dead. Well, you know who writes about it eventually? Peter. So turn to Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. After the book of Hebrews, after James, 2 Peter chapter 1. Keep in mind, not only, I mean, Peter's the one who's writing about this. Peter was one of those that was with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. But keep in mind, Peter spent three and a half years with Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry. So what did Peter see? Peter saw Jesus Christ turn the water into wine. He saw Jesus Christ raise people from the dead. He saw him heal the blind. He saw him fed the 5,000, feed the 4,000. He saw Jesus Christ do all those miracles. He was on the Mount of Transfiguration that we read about in Matthew and actually heard God the Father 
praised God the Son and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Peter saw all of that, and then he says this in 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, we'll pick it up in verse 13. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, Peter saying, as long as I am in this body, this body of flesh, yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. He's telling you I'm getting ready to pass from this life to the next. Even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me, moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He's referring back there to Matthew 17 and what happened. He says, for he received, speaking of Christ, he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. And then it says in verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Peter, the apostle Peter, who was on the Mount of Transfiguration, who saw Jesus Christ for three and a half years do all the things he did, saw him die on the cross, saw him raised from the dead, saw him, all that stuff, he says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. It's just written word. You say, well, how could that be? You always thought that miracles were so much more substantial, and that's what would get a hold of men's hearts. No, it doesn't work that way. You know, think of the miracles that God just did in the crossing of the Red Sea in order to get the, the children out of the nation of Israel, to get them out of Egypt, the ten different plagues he put them through, and then the miracle of the crossing the Red Sea, and how he caused the, the, the waves to... Uh, you know, to part, to dry the land, and then they crossed over, and then as soon as the Pharaoh's army is coming across, he caused them to go back down and kill them all. And then for 40 years, he, he led them in the wilderness, you know, uh, by a, a pillar of light or whatever, a cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night or whatever. <coughs> and he was there, and they saw all that stuff. They were fed with manna in the wilderness. They had quails come in and just litter the ground. I mean, you know, they got water out of a rock. You can go on and on and on. And every few years, a, a half a generation goes by, and the next thing you know, they're worshiping idols. I mean, Moses has gone 40 days up in the mount, and by the time he gets back down from spending 40 days and nights with God, they're already worshiping graven images that they made in a fire. Folks, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Because so I'll tell you what, Every person in this room, you think, you know what I really want? I want, I want the Lord Jesus Christ to come and spend a, with, give me 10 minutes tonight when I get home. Okay? Let's say he does. Let's say he shows up in your room tonight and he gives you a 10-minute conversation. And it's really not a conversation. It's him just talking to you. Wow. What could be more powerful than that? I'll tell you what. This book. Because you know what's going to happen? Tomorrow morning, you're going to say, Boy, I pretty much remember 99.9% .9 of what he said, but there's a few things I think I forgot. And then a week later, you're going to think, boy, I forgot a little bit more, but, you know, I'm beginning to wonder, now, was that even real? Did that really happen? And a month or a year goes by, and pretty soon it's nothing. But these words are eternal. They're supernatural. They're powerful, and you can rely on them. And according to Peter, we have a more sure word of prophecy. It's what's in this Bible. Okay, that being said, that's the introduction. Here's the short message. I want to talk about four simple aspects of these words. Four powerful effects that we get from these words. First of all, I want to say that these words, one of their supernatural effects on us is that they are very convicting. All right, I'll give you a couple examples. In the Old Testament, there's a king named Josiah. The Bible said about him, there was no king before him or after him that turned to the Lord his God with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might. God praised him. He was quite the king. But you know what? His father was a terrible king, King Ammon. And his grandfather, King Manasseh, the Bible said he was the most wicked king that ever lived. So what happened? What made Josiah turn to the Lord with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength? Well, 
what he was doing at a very young age is he started to send money to have the temple repaired that his father and grandfather had let get into disrepair. And as they were repairing parts of the temple, they came across a copy of the law, which is the first five books of our Bible. That's all the Bible they had back then. Keep in mind, this is, uh, I don't know the dates exactly, let's say around uh, 1500 BC, something like that, maybe not, not that old, but somewhere in there before King David. Anyway, um, they came across a copy of the law. Well, the king, it was actually one of the scribes that found it, and then he took that, he read what was in the, those five books, he said, the king needs to know about this. So he took the Bible to the king, we'll call it the Bible, uh, he took it to the king, uh, had it read to the king, and the king said, this is important, I want this read in the ears of everyone that I rule over. And he assembled everyone, not just the hierarchy, not just the princes and the uh, generals and so forth like that, <coughs> but all the common people as well. And he had the words of those first five books of the Bible, what they call the law, read in the ears of those people. And it was because of that, because of their super, supernatural convicting power, that a revival virtually took place. And that's why the Bible could say about what they had said about King Josiah. No king before him or after him turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might. Let's look at another example. Turn to the Gospel of John again. This time John chapter 8. While you're finding John 8, I'll tell you about a convicting uh, example of God's words. Peter is preaching at Pentecost, Acts, Acts chapter 2. You know who he's preaching to? He's preaching to the people that have just recently crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what happened when he just preached the convicting power of God's words? The Bible says upwards of 3,000 souls got saved because the words of God are supernaturally convicting. I mentioned in Hebrews 4.12, they are a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. You can fool God, you can fool yourself, but you can't fool these words. These words know what you're thinking. They will discern what you're thinking, and they will actually bring them to your conscious mind. And then you have the opportunity to confess or forsake those things, <coughs> or to just ignore that, that conviction that you're under. Here in John chapter 8, It says, Jesus, verse 1, Jesus went unto the Mount, Olive, uh, Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again unto the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What sayest thou? This, they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. In other words, they're asking him to say, Jesus, uh, Moses in the law says that we should be stoning this woman. What do you say? He just ignores them, but he bends down and writes something in the ground. Verse 7, so when they had continued asking him, he lifted up himself and he said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine those accusers? Where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So here's what's happening. Jesus Christ... Uh, He's trying to teach them. The Pharisees, the scribes, they bring in this woman caught in the very act of adultery. And they say to Jesus, you know, Moses and the law says, your Bible, the book, says that we should stone this woman. What do you say? He ignores them. He writes something in the ground. The Bible doesn't tell us what. Um, they ask him again. Moses and the law says she'd be stoned. What do you say? Again, he kind of, you know, he says that well, him that is without sin first cast a stone. And then he bends down and writes something in the ground. Now, if the Lord Jesus Christ wrote something on the ground, in my, in my book, that's scripture, all right? Chances are he, he might have, this is my theory, it's probably, a, should be a fairly good theory. Uh, he probably wrote something from Leviticus chapter 20 or Deuteronomy chapter 22. Those are the two areas in the law, the first five books, that mention the penalty for adultery. And it is to stone both 
parties to death. I don't know if you got the picture here. They only brought him a woman. Chances are one of those people around that perimeter was a guilty party. I don't know that for sure. Verse 9, though, it says, and then when they heard it, heard what? Heard what he wrote or what he said, him that is without sin. Either one of those were scripture, whether he wrote something in the ground or what he said was obviously scripture because it's in our scriptures. He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone. So when they heard it, it says they were convicted by their own conscience. And you know what pricked that conscience? It was the convicting power of these words. The words of God, they're very convicting. They're also very correcting. Turn to Psalm 119. So this is that long, long chapter in our Bible. It's usually almost in the very center of your Bible. Psalm 119. And we'll look at four verses here. I want to tell you that these words not only are convicting, but they're correcting in two different ways. First, when you think of something that's correcting, uh, let's say you want to take a correct measurement. Don't you need a standard to go by? Yeah, you need a correct standard if you're going to measure something uh, properly, correctly. Well, I don't have a wooden ruler up here, but if I did, I would say this is my correct standard. It's a wooden ruler. You know, if you had a tape measure or whatever, you have a standard to go by. It gives you the correct measurement. We have a correct standard, too determine the rightness of something, the truth of something. It's the word of God's. The word of God, every word is pure. Thy word is true. Okay? Uh, if you want to know absolute truth on planet Earth, it's in this book. If it's, if it's contrary to this book, then it's not true. Because whatever's in this book is true. Um, now, not only does a wooden ruler, for example, give you a correct standard, a correct measurement, but let me, let me not just drop it there. Uh, so what I'm getting at is as far as our correct standard, let's say uh, you want to know about baptism. What do I, should I get baptized? Well, the answer to that is in our final authority. It'll tell you if you should get baptized. It'll tell you why you should get baptized and how you should get baptized. But it's not just for questions like that. How about, uh, how do I get saved? Is there something I need to do to stay saved? Uh, questions like that, eternal security. Those answers to those questions are in this book. But it comes much more, uh, it's much more significant, goes much deeper than that. When I say deeper, it's deeper in one respect, but in another respect it's really surface. Because every little decision you and I make throughout our, each and every day of our lives, we can make better decisions if we know the principles that are outlined in this book. So should I look at this? Should I allow this into my eyes? Well, the answers would come in this book. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It light, puts light on your decision. Should I allow uh, myself to listen to this kind of music? Should I look at these kinds of things? Should I taste this? Should I put this in my mouth? Should I touch that? Should I go here? Should I go there? Every simple decision you make throughout your life, there's principles in this book that guide you and direct you to make the correct decisions. It is our correct standard. Well, that wooden ruler, and if I have, sorry, I don't have one, but if I did have one, I would tell you it can correct a person's behavior. Because if this was my wooden ruler, and I was to slap it down like that, that's what the teachers used to do back in the 60s and the 50s. They'd use a wooden ruler to correct a child's behavior. You know the beautiful thing about that? It's not like the Ritalin and the stuff you get today, because with that wooden ruler, it, it's immediate, it's effective, and there's no uh, residual uh, payments to be made down the road. I'm talking about drug addiction and so forth, okay? But it's effective. It's our correct, it'll correct our behavior. So will these words correct our behavior. Look in Psalm 119, and we'll look at four verses. We'll start in verse 71. The Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 71, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Now, why does the Bible say that? Well, look in verse 67. Psalm 119, verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. This is part of my personal testimony. Because in 2003, having been uh, made a, uh, a statement of profession 
some 30 years before that, I kind of came to the end of myself and God afflicted me. <coughs> and when he did afflict me and he gave me a little understanding about a few things, I kind of gave up and said, okay, Lord, I do give up. What do you want me to do? Whatever you want me to do. But this was it. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. Since that day forward, I mean, I haven't been perfect, but I've been concerned more than I ever was before about keeping God's words, about drawing close to God and finding out what it is he wanted for me in my life. Uh, look at verse 75. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness hath afflicted me. Folks, if you're going through an affliction, you need to call out to God and say, Lord, what are you trying to show me? It might not be you going through the affliction. It might be your husband or your wife or your child or your parent or your pastor or your co-worker or your employee, <coughs> your employer, neighbor, friend, whoever. The closer someone is to you, including yourself, that's going through an affliction, the more you and I need to cry out, God, Lord, what are you trying to show me through that particular affliction? I know you have a purpose for it. And boy, you'll be surprised sometimes if you will seek God's mind on a matter like that, maybe you won't have to suffer through that affliction a second time, a third time, a fifth time. Okay? How bad can it get? Look down in verse uh, 92. Unless thy law had been my delights, I should have then perished in mine affliction. The Bible says this, Whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. God corrects us just like a parent, an earthly parent, wants to correct their child when they misbehave because they love them. They don't want to see them get into trouble from being dis disobedient. The words of God, they're convicting, they're correcting, they're also very <coughs> cleansing. I'm going to skip through some of these verses here and just quote them to you. So, the words of God, I'm telling you, they're cleansing. They have a supernatural ability to cleanse. When uh, the Apostle Paul wrote about Jesus Christ, mentioned in Ephesians chapter 5 how he loved the church and gave his life for it that he might sanctify it and cleanse it. He's talking about the church, that's the body of believers, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word of God. God likens these words to water to be the fact that they're able to cleanse us spiritually. We already read, I think, in John 17, 17, the Bible said, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Do look in Psalm 51. This is King David. He wrote this psalm right after he'd been confronted about the sin he had with Bathsheba. <coughs> and King David writes in Psalm 51, verse 2, he says, Wash me truly, from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Look down at verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Now, King David, he's writing this around, you know, 1000 B.C. He didn't have the book of Jeremiah. <coughs> that came 300 years later, three, 400 years later. Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who could know it? But I'll tell you what King David did have. He had the law. He had the first five books of the Bible. King David recognized that only God could supernaturally clean an earthen vessel. You know what you and I are? We've been made out of clay. I hope you know that. Adam was made out of clay, the dust of the ground. We're earthen vessels. And only God can clean an earthen vessel. King David knew that. He had Leviticus that talked about over and over again. If you offer a sin offering, if you sod in that sin offering, you soak it in a brazen... Uh, vessel, a bowl of some kind, um, you're supposed to wash it under running water. But if you sod in that uh, <coughs> sin offering in an earthen vessel, you need to break it. Okay? If you have an earthen vessel that touches something dead, you're to destroy it. You're to break it. If a, a brass vessel or a cloth vessel or a wood vessel touches something dead, you don't have to destroy it. You just wash it under running water. Over and over, King David got that message. Only God can clean an earthen vessel. That's pointing to you and I near 2018. We are an earthen vessel. God wants to clean us up because God doesn't use dirty things. 
God uses clean things. God uses empty things. He wants vessels that are clean and empty and available. <coughs> God wants us to be clean, and he'll supernaturally cleanse us with these words. So the words of God, they're convicting, they're correcting, they're cleansing, and lastly, they are comforting. <coughs> The Bible said in 1 John 5, 13, I will not leave you comfortless. That's Jesus Christ speaking. I will not leave you comfortless. Now, he's talking about, first and foremost, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. He's going to send the Comforter. He's also talking about he's left it with these words, which are very comforting, because they contain precious promises. Promises like Philippians 14, or 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. That's a precious promise that can be comforting. I'm sure you all know Romans 8.28. I hope you do. God is able to make all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. That can get you through some tough times. That should be comforting. How about 1 John 5.13? <coughs> These things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life. That's comforting to me, to know that I'm going to be in heaven one day. You say, that's arrogant. No, that's the, the Bible. The Bible says you can know that you're going to be in heaven one day. That's why he wrote this book too. So, people think that's arrogant. They don't believe their Bible. They don't believe God. They don't take advantage of the precious promises in this book. Christian, uh, I just want to give you more armor tonight. That's the purpose of the message. Maybe strengthen your faith. Because it says, turn if you will, please, the, the book of Thessalonians. I mentioned this verse in passing this morning. Just like the effectual and fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, we have a similar promise here in the First Thessalonians. I think it's in chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now I like to take that verse two ways, and I believe it should be taken two ways. Not only do these words <coughs> work in you if you effect, you know, effectually if you believe them, but they also work in the lives of the believer as well. So the words are powerful; they're supernatural, and they can do some wonderful things. You know, I've done some meetings at some pretty good churches where they used a King James Bible, but I don't think they totally believed it because they spent a lot of time going to Greek and Hebrew and stuff like that. And you know what? I don't think they recognized, at least I'm talking about the pastor there maybe, I don't think that pastor realized what he had. He had the perfect words of God. I don't have to go to a Greek or Hebrew. Uh, I mean, if it helps shed some light on what this English is trying to say, I'm all for that. Uh, but boy, there's so much in the English, I don't find myself doing that. Uh, I don't find myself looking for something that's not here but it might be in a different language, you know, an ancient language or the Greek or the Hebrew that this came from. You know, that to me, that's not important. God gave us these words. They're pure. He said he preserved these words forever. I, I guess, uh, you know, we should take that at face value. They effectually work in us that believe them. Not only will they make us more powerful, but they'll do something to us, transform us, because we actually believe and appreciate what they were. Just like that church at Thessalonica. He says, uh, because ye, ye received it, it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. These are God's words. They're powerful, man. They're convicting, they're correcting, they're cleansing, they're comforting. I could have gone on and on because they potentially are controlling and conquering, confounding, confirming, critiquing. They caution us, they can clothe us. You can go on and on, and that's just with the letter C. So you can imagine where I could go if we opened up the whole alphabet. Folks, we don't need to. These words of God are powerful. Take advantage of them. 
the more you get to apply them to your life, the better a child of God you'll be for God's glory, and the more prepared you'll be when you stand before Him one day at the judgment seat of Christ. Amen? Mm -hmm. uh, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the time that was spent here tonight around your words. Lord, uh, we sure do appreciate their power. Lord, I pray that your special touch of your grace on each and every uh, soul in this room this evening, Lord, that you might give us the grace to have a real insatiable appetite to spend time in these words, Lord, that we might get to know you better, uh, allow you to strengthen us better, uh, to make us the Christian you desire us to be step by step, Lord, that we might honor you and glorify you with the lives that you've given us, Lord. We love you. We thank you so much for the opportunities you give us. We thank you for this wonderful place that you've provided for us to fellowship throughout the week, Lord. And I pray again for Pastor Price as they travel back to the home church here, Lord. Keep him safe. Keep him strong in <coughs> life. And as Charlie mentioned this morning, Lord, I pray that uh, this short trip, although it was probably a, a lot of driving and a lot of uh, uh, not much downtime, I pray, Lord, that somehow it would refresh him and recharge him stay fresh in the ministry for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Anybody else have anything to say? Anybody want to come up here? If not, you are all dismissed. Amen. amen.